Father, during this time, I pray that more than anything, you would speak and help us to get out of the way so that these, your people, may hear your word and be drawn closer to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Zachary was four. Came screaming out of the bathroom one day. It was like World War III had broken out. His mama finally got him to calm down and she discovered that he had dropped his toothbrush in the toilet. This young mother knew what needed to be done and, and being fearless with it came to her children. She went into the bathroom and sure enough there in the toilet was his toothbrush and she fished it out and she said, now what are we going to do with this, Zachary? And he said, well, brush our teeth. She said, no, we're going to throw it away. Any time a toothbrush goes into the toilet, we always throw it away. So what are we going to do with it, Zachary? She, he said, we're going to throw it away. So he watched her as she took his prized toothbrush and threw it in the trash can. Stood there for a moment. Then he ran back into the bathroom. He reappeared with her toothbrush, and he held it up and announced, We better throw your toothbrush away too, because I dropped it in the toilet a few days ago. We do not want to throw away God tonight. We do not want to throw away God in the United States. We do not want to throw away our Bibles ever, ever again because they have not been polluted. They are still applicable to our life. So I want you to take your Bibles tonight and I want you to turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch. I'm going to be very diligent in watching and listening to see what he, God, will speak to me. He's expecting God to give him a revelation. He's expecting God to talk to him. Do you approach God in prayer? Do you open the Bible? Do you go to church expecting God to say something to you? And how I may reply when I am reproved. Verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, God did not disappoint. This is what he said. Record, write it down. Write it down so you will not forget. Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. It's not only for you, but it's for the people around you also. Verse 3. For the vision, now watch this, the word is going to come. But the vision is not yet fulfilled. It is for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. There's one thing that it's impossible for God to do. God cannot, will not, has not lied. He will never, ever lie. He always tells the truth. He always keeps his promises. It will not fail. Though it tarries, wait. For it will certainly come, it will not delay. Verse 4, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Said a couple of weeks ago, without faith it's impossible to please God. But with faith, faith always causes you to be faithful to God, to stand on the rampart, to stand on your station, the vision. What is the vision? Uh, we're talking about a, a, a Habakkuk. It is one of the bedrocks of the Old Testament. You're going to find out that this verse that we read just a while ago, verse 4, the righteous will live by his faith, uh, uh, just overwhelmingly affected the Apostle Paul, overwhelmingly affected John Wesley, overwhelmingly affected John Calvin. If you are an evangelical, you have been affected by this verse. You have been impacted by this. If you've ever read the New Testament, you've been impacted by this verse. 
If, you have, uh, if you're more of the Presbyterian line or the Calvinistic line or maybe the Armenian line of, of Christianity, the Methodist line, you have been overwhelmingly affected by the fact that God said to this man, the righteous will live by his faith. I am sure that when you look at this, people would have said to, about Habakkuk, well, he was a failure. I mean, he had this little old ministry, and he really didn't amount to much. I mean, he wasn't on the Internet. He wasn't on television. He didn't have a radio ministry. He, he really didn't get outside of his venue there. He was, he was an absolute abject failure, but yet... For thousands of years, he's still being preached and people are still hearing what God told him. That's why God said the vision, the vision, write it down. Make sure others hear it. Tell it to others. Habakkuk is a journal of, ho of a holy man who lived long ago in a religious society that had forgotten about God. They were re religious, they'd just forgotten about God. It's a prayer journal. What does he say? God, you have given me a vision. You see, a prophet, he not only foretells. Watch this. You need to listen to this. But he foretells. Sometimes we have people in the church who call themselves prophets who just got a bad attitude. No, a prophet is not a control freak. A prophet does not have a bad attitude. He has stood before God and he's seen God. And he does know the future because he have, has a vision. But he also encourages and strengthens and builds up the congregation, the church. And so Habakkuk says the first thing he says, God is awesome. That word awesome means the mere presence inspires fear and awe. It means that it, it, you land in a mysterious silence when you're before God. It's awesome to stand before God. That's why Habakkuk has already said the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Listen, anytime you have a relationship, there's two-way communication. Right now, God is saying to Habakkuk, there's going to come a time to talk, but right now, listen. Listen. God is in heaven. God observes the ways of men. God tries the hearts of nations. God is aware of what is going on right now. He knows. And by the way, he takes his, this personally. He knows that his welfare, he knows that his reputation is on the line. And he is jealous. He is wrathful. We would almost call him vengeful. God is insulted by a lack of reverence for his holiness. Behold, he says in verse 4, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. God is saying when the standard of righteousness is lowered for a people, for a nation, for a home, for a church, then it will act and react on each and every individual of that society, of that congregation, of that home. And he says, at that point in time, I am prepared. If somebody will just turn to me, I will intervene forcefully and decisively in that life, and I will save your life, literally, and I will save your soul, literally. And he wants to act if you will react. So the first thing I notice is the wonder of God. Second thing I notice is the Word of God. The Word of God. I heard about an electrical engineer. He was a head of a large engineering firm in New York City. His offices were high up in the World Trade Center. On September the 11th, he was late. He had never been late in the history of his working life. He had never been late, but it just something happened and he was late. In fact, he was 45 minutes late. And when he arrived, everyone, everyone, every person in his company and on his floor were dead. Everybody except him. He was still alive. He struggled with that. He asked, well, why did this happen? God didn't answer. 
Why doesn't he answer? And God didn't answer. Here it is, black print on white paper. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right with him. But the righteous, even when you don't understand, you will live by the faithfulness of your faith. You will understand and you will know that God is on station and he is acting and he is working and he is speaking in your life. The righteous one, the one whose soul is one with God, he will live by faith. He doesn't understand what's going on. He might not feel what's going on. He might not hear what's going on. God might be delaying. He wants to give up. He wants to be, he's alone. He wants to be discouraged, but God still doesn't answer. But he continues to go like a marathoner. Even though he's hit the wall, he just keeps going and going and going because that's how he's programmed. He knows there's a God, and he knows that God's inside of him, and he knows that God's speaking, and he knows that God's moving. This engineer, I heard a few years ago, his blood pressure skyrocketed, probably from the depression. He was taken to the hospital. They gave him some medication that he was allergic to. They didn't know it, and he died. When we look at that and we say, well, why did God spare him to take him? That's not the question. Habakkuk says that's not the question. The question is why did God create him to start with? Why did God create you to start with? Why has God blessed you to start with? Why has God preserved you to start with? So that you may be faithful and have that faithful life and bring glory to God, not for a day, not for a week, not for a year, but for all eternity. God says, look out, look, look way out. Habakkuk, look beyond. Write this down. So Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand on my guard post. You, you decide what you want to do. I'm going to be at my place. I'm going to station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And how I may reply when I'm reproved. I, I'm, I'm going to say, I know exactly what I'm going to say to God. I'm going to say, God have mercy on me. I will serve, I will watch, and when God speaks, I will listen. I'm going to have a faithful heart, and I'm going to have a receptive heart, and I'm going to have a molded heart. I will be faithful. For those whose soul is right within them, they will live by faith. And then God says in verse 2, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision, scribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. What's he saying? He's saying, make your life a billboard. It's not only for you, it's for the people around you. It's for your husband, it's for your wife, it's for your children. When they see your faithfulness, they will be encouraged. Now, now, now there's a, if you go to the exegesis of this scripture right here, they, you, you just put a big question mark. Anybody who, who comes up and says, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what this says, is, is not being intellectually honest with you. Either they have not studied their Bible or they don't know how to study their Bible. There, there's one of two ways you can go here with the construction of the Hebrew. And so I don't know. I can tell you what, what it means if you look at it one way. It means one way, the traveler in a hurry can read it. Write it down so people that are in a hurry got something else to do, somewhere else to do, they can still read it. They'll notice you. They'll stop and they'll notice you. They can read it. Or it's for the messenger who's giving warning. You better stop right here, pal. You better stop. You better look. You better listen. Write it clearly. You need to be like Martin Luther. I've already told you about Wesley and Calvin and Paul. Martin Luther was impacted by this verse too. When he read those words, the just shall live by faith, as was repeated in Romans by the apostle Paul, it, it to totally changed his life. Uh, for Calvin and for Martin Luther, it was uh, what we call the Reformation. And basically what they ended up hearing from this, the same thing, it's 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 mind-boggling. God says the same thing to them that he said to Habakkuk. It's the whole reason that we had the Reformation. Man can go to God for a word. 
You don't have to go. They said, you don't have to go through a pope. You don't have to go through some preacher. You don't have to go through anybody else. You can go directly to God. You have that privilege. You have that invitation. You need to write that down somewhere. That's what Habakkuk said. Write it down. God has given you an invitation. You need to frame it. You need to put it up. I have a word from God. God speaks to me. Now, I've been in church long enough. That I know, I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Those of you that are a little bit more cynical. You've heard people get up and say, well, the Lord said to me, and you say, oh, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. So I don't know how to look at this except to say, when God speaks, he's saying to you, God, will speak to you, and to you, and to you, and to you, and to me, and to them. He'll speak to all of us. And what he says to you, he'll say to you, and he says to you, and he says to you, and he says to me. It resonates in your soul. You know what they did to Martin Luther? They took him to Worms, Worms, W-O-R-M-S, it's Worms. It's a, it's a town there in Germany. They, they brought him before the ecclesiastical court. Now, church court then wasn't like church court now. They had him killed. They, they, were, they were the judge, jury, prosecuting attorney, and, and uh, lawyer, all tied up in one. They brought him down to Worms. And they said, did you write that? Martin Luther didn't say a word. They knew he wrote it because he had signed it. Did you write that, they said? Do you really believe that men can go directly to Jesus? Do you really believe? This is the line of questioning. Do you really believe that Jesus saves and not the church? Do you believe salvation comes by grace and not the cup? By, by grace through Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, and not through the ordinance of the church? Do you really believe that? Mark Luther didn't say a word. Did not say a word. Now, he is one of the most brilliant priests that they had. And he was turning Germany upside down for Jesus Christ. So they looked at him and said, Martin, this was people that he'd gone to school with. This has been his friend. Now they're his adversaries. They say, if you will deny this, we will spare your life. And was silent. Remember, Martin Luther's got a word from God. God told him that. God told him, the just shall live by faith. God told John Wesley, the just shall live by faith. God told John Calvin, the just shall live by faith. God told the Apostle Paul, the just shall live by faith. I mean, it's replete throughout all the scripture. You are getting right now firsthand what these guys had to spend years before they found out about. Martin Luther didn't say a word, and he stood up. And for all to hear, he didn't whisper it, he thundered. If every spire is a demon and all of hell were here today, I wrote that, I cannot believe anything else, here I stand. doubt about what he believed see God does not want us to have a belief system where we say well you know well you know I, I, don't, I don't know that I agree with you on that God says what do you believe what have you heard me say to you no question make your life a billboard make it an advertisement for Jesus Christ Jesus saves Jesus alone and I know him and he is my Lord and Savior and I am not going to back off of that. I don't care what it costs me. The wonder of God, the word of God, the way of God. Verse 3, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal. It will not fail, though it tarries. Wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. 
one problem there. Well, why doesn't God answer it just right now? Have you ever asked that? Why, why does God just do something right here, right now? Oh, right, 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 right now. I mean, I've prayed. I have faith. I've done everything that's supposed to be. Why not now? When I was in seminary, we lived in Seminary Village, and I would go for a 1 o'clock class, and then I had a 4 o'clock class, and our house was too far to go back and then come back, and so I would just go over to the library, and I started wandering around the library, and I, I went back in one of those areas where nobody ever goes. I mean, you would get in back there, and you'd just your eyes would start watering, and you'd start sneezing if you're allergic to dust, I, and I'd start reading these books about the great men of God, in history past, the great missionary movements. And, and I'll be honest with you, I was right there. I believe God had given me a vision. I believe God had said something to me. And, and, and I said, God, I don't understand this. When you ask me, tell me to do something, you want me to do it right then. And when I ask you to do something, you say, wait, why do you do that, God? Have you ever asked God that? Why do you do that, God? You know what he told me? He said, because I'm God. You're not. You wait. Because I can tell you, every day you wait, it gets better. You are not ready for the magnitude of what I'm giving, going to give you. And I don't know what that is for your life. I knew what it was for my life. In the book, God told Habakkuk, if I told you right now what I'm about to do, you wouldn't believe it. Habakkuk said, tell me. He said, I'm going to bring the Chaldeans. I'm going to bring this fierce, idol-worshiping, star-gazing pagans, and they will come like a swarm. They will overrun. They will overtake. They will obliterate everything. They'll destroy the temple. They'll destroy the holy city, Jerusalem. They'll destroy the nation. They'll destroy everything. And Habakkuk said, I can't believe that. And then God says, but the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans will cease to be. Do you know where Babylon is right now? Babylon, which was, was more grand than Washington, D.C. is right now. Babylon is now barely, if they even have a train there, a whistle stop on the Baghdad Railroad. Others have come, others have gone. Others have tried to wipe out the people of God. But guess what? They're still alive. They still stand saying that God is in control. But the bottom line of faith is not to sil silence all our doubts, to but, but to make us sure that God is still moving in his people. The great English poet of the 18th century by the name of William Cowper. When he was 32, he was uh, uh, obsessed and he was depressed. A great crisis came and he decided that suicide was the only way out. 32 years old, he's going to kill himself. God had other plans. He intended to take his life with poison. It didn't work. He got sick and vomited. Next morning, he hired a coach and drove to the Thames, and he's planning to jump, and the driver of the coach wouldn't let him. He literally physically restrained him. Following morning, he fell upon a knife, and the blade broke. I mean, stop and think about this. He can't even kill himself. Two weeks later, he tried to hang himself, but he was cut down while unconscious and revived. Then at the bottom, when he was the worst he had ever been, he found the Bible, and he opened the Bible just by happenstance. All these plans didn't come about, but he just found a Bible, just happened to find a Bible, and he opened the Bible, and he read, The just shall live by faith. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. There was. Later he wrote, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the seas and rides upon the storm. Deep and unfathomable mind with never failing skill. He traces out his bright design 
and works his sovereign will. God is in control. He knows what he's all about. Over and over, he tells the same story. All around us, we emphasize our ways, ourselves, me, my, I. But God says, no, no, that's not the truth. That's not the vision. The vision is the just shall live by faith.